Jamal. Two balls and a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Walk the ball. Hey everyone, welcome into Dodger Heads Live presented by DodgerBlue.com. My name is Matthew Moreno and joining me tonight is Blake Williams who uh, may or may not be under a heated blanket as we sit here and record this show. Uh, Blake was out at Manhattan Beach and did, uh, what are we going to call it, about a quarter, pl- uh, quarter per- 25% uh, polar plunge? I'd say maybe 15%. My feet and ankles got soaked and... I track sand everywhere back to my house, so it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, if you uh, if you missed it, Blake was out at Manhattan Beach, uh, the, the pier this morning for Chris Taylor and Mary Taylor, his wife, uh, their C23 Foundations event. They had a polar plunge. Uh, a video recap is up of all the players sprinting into the ocean and diving. Uh, Blake even got some uh, video of Dave Roberts giving everybody uh, kind of, I guess, some pro tips, if you will of how to dive properly into the ocean so that people weren't going to hurt themselves. So definitely check that out once we're done here. Uh, we want to thank everybody for joining us again on the for this live show. And if you're podcasting, we appreciate you guys as well. Uh, as we mentioned in the comments, tonight's show is going to be a little bit different. Blake and I are going to touch on a couple of uh, newsworthy things that have sort of happened in the past few days. Uh, and then we're going to you know recap Dodger Fest and also the Dodgers uh, – community tour that they had this past week. And uh, I can say this uh, with full, like Blake and I, between us, we covered uh, every single day of the community tour. And we were the, I'm proud to say, we were the only outlet that was at an event every single day. And that included, like I said, it culminated with Dodger Fest on Saturday. And then Saturday night, Mookie had his bowling event, which we were at. And then again, uh, Blake this morning was at Chris Taylor's event, and we still have uh, one more on deck tomorrow morning, bright and early for Blake. Uh, it may have a little different feel because of rain, but uh, he might be catching up. He should be catching up with Justin Turner and uh, his wife, Courtney, and whoever is going to be able to show uh, show up to support their uh, golf tournament tomorrow. And so, yeah. That, uh, again, just a reminder, is if you're new here, please remember to like and subscribe, like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel and all that. And if you're listening to us in the podcast form, please be sure to do the same there. The rate and reviewing us uh, definitely helps our show grow and uh, we can continue to expand and keep things going. So let's get into uh, the news for tonight. And Blake, as we were at, uh, I'm going to do my best to not call it Fan Fest. I don't know if you caught the video Jeff and I did. I made a joke about it saying, you know, we need to call it Dodger Fest, not Fan Fest. I got it right like once or twice. And then I proceeded to call it Fan Fest throughout the rest of the video without even knowing. I know I've been texting you Fan Fest because at this point I just don't care. Like it is Fan Fest to me, at least off the air. But when we're reviewing this, out of respect to the Dodgers changing the name, we want to try to uh, certainly abide by that. That's the, the big J journalism in us, if you will. Uh, so we're standing in the bullpen, and John Heyman tweets that the Dodgers have signed uh, Denilson Lamette to a minor league contract. Uh, I know you wrote the article for us. That's up on DodgerBlue.com. What are some of your immediate thoughts to this? So Lamette is a pitcher I've liked for a while now. He ha- He's had a high ceiling type player for most of his career but as tradition with the Dodgers kind of signing these types of guys he has dealt with a lot of injuries also throughout his career that's kind of limited him he has an elite slider that's helped him rack up a lot of strikeouts when he's on the mound the problem is every season since his debut in 2017 he's thrown fewer and fewer innings each season so I think he hit the 100 mark in 2017 and then it dropped down to like 80 or something like that and then 30 and 20 and it just keeps going down but if he can stay on the mound and be healthy, he could potentially be a guy to make an impact in the Dodgers bullpen. He's kind of bounced around with a few teams now, most notably with the Padres to start his career. And in 2020, he finished fourth in Cy Young voting as a starting pitcher there. But now his outlook is more of a reliever, hoping they can kind of keep him healthy with one inning stints, which some teams have kind of tried and hasn't successfully worked out necessarily. But when he's on the mound, he has high upside. He gets a lot of strikeouts. But more recently, he's had some struggles with walks, but it's still a minor league signing. If the Dodgers can work a bit of their magic and maybe just keep him healthy for a few months, he could be an impact reliever down the stretch. But 
it's just a minor league signing. So even if it doesn't work out, there's not too much to be mad about. Yeah, and one thing uh, I forgot until reading your article was that he was involved in the uh, Josh Hader trade in August 2022. Uh but the Brewers quickly DFA'd him, and then Lamette was claimed by the Rockies. Uh, he remained there to finish that season. He was with uh, Colorado for part of 2023 as well. He was then released in June, signed by the Red Sox, then released again in August because he struggled. Uh, like you said, you know, career ERA is over four. Uh, there are some strikeout uh, rate, uh, not issues there, but uh, positive takeaways to be uh, with that. Uh, I think the biggest thing, again, we we might sound like a little bit of a broken record, whether it's me, you, or Jeff. I know you just alluded to it. It's a minor league signing. Uh, it doesn't cost the Dodgers. I mean, it, it fine, it's money, but it really doesn't cost the Dodgers. There's not a roster space. And, you know, they do have a 40-man roster crunch, which should be alleviated a little bit this week when they can start putting players on the 60-day injured list. And that might may or may not uh, tie into maybe some Clayton Kershaw news possibly coming later this week, maybe next week. Uh, but, yeah, you know, Lamette. I think uh, basically he's a it, he's a low risk, not not necessarily high upside guy, just because I'm not sure how what his ceiling is at this point, given some of his struggles. And I know he had Tommy John surgery a few years ago. Uh, but hey, I mean, if he gives if he's able to give the Dodgers some sort of depth out of their bullpen at some point in the season, that'll work out. I I worry uh, what it might mean for Jimmy Nelson, though. I know that he him and the Dodgers seem to be attached at the hip for the past few years, but I don't know if that's going to continue. Yeah, I've been kind of joking. Lamette fills the Jimmy Nelson role as off-injured reliever with high upside that the Dodgers just keep around in their organization. So we'll see. At this point, I don't think Jimmy Nelson's going to come back. They've given him a few chances to make his way back and get healthy, and it just hasn't really worked out there. So Lamette's going to be their next project to try there. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I want to recognize Walgreens 27 Richmond for a Super Chat sticker. We appreciate that. And a reminder, if you do, you know, tonight's show, like I said at the beginning, is going to be a little bit different. We're going to uh, plan on answering more questions from you guys than normal. We do our best to get to them uh, every single episode. But tonight, like I said, the news, we're going to kind of keep to a minimum and then do a little bit of recap. And we want to answer questions you might have about Dodger Fest or the community uh, tour that the Dodgers had. Like I said, Blake and I were out there this past week. We were out at the stadium. So if there's something you might want to know, not necessarily on the inside, but kind of behind the scenes stuff. We'll do our best to get to those. And if you want to make sure that your question is answered, then Super Chat is the way to go. We will stop what we're doing and we will definitely get to that. So, yeah, that's it on uh, Lamette. That was, uh, I think, early into Dodger Fest. I almost said Fan Fest. Uh, the next sort of news that came from Dodger Stadium was Nick Frasso revealing that he had surgery last November to repair uh, a tear in. The, the labrum of his right shoulder and Frasso seemed to think that he wasn't going to pitch at all this season, which is, I think, disappointing considering uh, some of the upside he showed. And he was probably, I mean, is it safe to say candidate to make his MLB debut this year? Yeah, I think it was likely at some point. Yeah. So he said, you know, he's not necessarily expecting to pitch. Brandon Gomes was a little bit more optimistic. He spoke after Frasso. And so when he was asked about the injury and the surgery, he said, you know, it was fortunately more of a minor tear than a significant tear in his right shoulder. And that the Dodgers actually uh, considered just having him sort of rehab it and not have surgery before they made the decision to just do uh, the operation. Gomes said that he left the door open for Frasso possibly returning late in the year, but he also said, you know, he's a young guy. He's one of their prospects. They're not going to push him if he's not ready for that. Uh, Blake, I mean, not necessarily a whole lot here. Obviously, we feel bad for, for Frasso, but in terms of uh, maybe his development or projections moving forward, like, is his timeline, if he does miss all of this year, do you think that it's going to delay maybe him reaching the majors at some point? Just because I imagine... Once he is healthy and ready to pitch, he's going to need to knock off some rust down at the uh, minor league level. Yeah, maybe a bit of a rehab assignment type thing that's going to delay him. Just building back up after a shoulder surgery is tough, so that's going to push back your outlook a bit there. It's disappointing because he was supposed to make his debut this year, so maybe now we're looking at late 2025, maybe early 2026 instead. So it's tough for them, but... I think if he was able to come back this year, it would be limited to a reliever role and we wouldn't necessarily see him starting, which maybe ultimately could benefit the Dodgers down the stretch because, you know, they always need relievers. And he's a guy who has 
elite stuff. So if he can kind of get that back, it would be beneficial for the Dodgers. But I think they're just going to play it safe and kind of keep him on the sidelines until next season or even after that, as they kind of slow played Walker Bueller this past season. So they don't want to really rush their pitchers back from injury, especially with the guy they have high hopes for and a lot of team control. Yeah, I agree with you. I, and I think if if Frasso does pitch this year, uh, it's not going to be for the Dodgers. I think by the time he would potentially start a rehab assignment and maybe you know generate some sort of rhythm or consistency, the Dodgers aren't uh, going to. That's that's going to come. It's going to be too late in the year if that does happen. And so, yeah, you know, unfortunate development for Nick. Uh, we obviously wish him all the best in his uh, rehab process this year. Uh, sticking on the pitching front, this one impacting the Dodgers a little bit more uh, significantly, but not necessarily much of a surprise. Uh, Brandon Gomes and Dave Roberts basically confirmed, which they had sort of been hinting at at various points this offseason, that Walker Buehler is not going to be part of the opening day rotation. Uh, Blake, you know, considering that that is the case, what's your... Uh, how do you think the Dodgers will put together their rotation then to begin the season? I don't necessarily need the order, but maybe what five pitchers do you see making it? Well, that's why they brought in the big maple and they got <laughs> Emmett Shee in there. So you're going to get your top three of Yamamoto, Glass now, and Bobby Miller. And then you're going to add in Paxton and Sheehan. And that's still a fantastic group. And hopefully you get Walker Bueller back at full strength at whatever point that is. And he'll be an addition to it. That's what you can hope for. So it's kind of good that they have him like, waiting in the wings a bit there because you know at some point they're going to need a starting pitcher early in the season it's just always how it works so maybe they'll get lucky and the timing will work out there so it's good that they're gonna play it safe with him and make sure he's ready for the postseason essentially because that's what they're playing for i think it's pretty safe to say the division's locked up and walker bueller being out a few months isn't going to change anything for them so or even like a few weeks if it's shorter than that we're not sure how long they're going to actually keep him out. It's just they're going to slow play him so they don't have to like start and stop him during the season as much. Yeah, and one thing uh, Brandon Gomes did say is that Bueller's not a candidate to start the season on the 60-day injured list. So at least for now, at least publicly, uh, what the Dodgers are suggesting is that he'll his delayed start to the season will be fewer than uh, two months, and I guess maybe even – less than that because you could technically start the 60 day uh, IL uh, this week. So, you know, at least uh, my guess then based on that is he's delayed two weeks, three weeks, maybe uh, are you, is there any surprise that maybe they don't? And yes, no more FOMO says Bueller's busy being a new dad. Yeah. Bueller did announce, uh, I think tonight earlier this afternoon that him and uh, his wife, Mackenzie welcome their first child. Uh, is there any surprise though, that maybe they didn't, necessarily let Bueller sort of start the season just to see what you sort of have and then figure out a way to rest him as the year goes on, as opposed to delaying him and then maybe letting him finish it all the way through. I don't think so because they're still going to have time to evaluate him, even if he has a slow start to the season and see if they need to go make a move for someone else or continue shutting him down. It's more just, they don't want to start him and then stop him and then start him again, because there's going to be that build up time in between I'm sure they had conversations with Bueller about the best way to go about it for himself and how the team's going to manage themselves. They have the depth right now to make it work. You might not have that depth a bit later in the season, depending on other injuries that come up. So I think it makes the most sense to delay the start and then hope he can just pitch through the season without having to start and stop him. Yeah, fair enough. And we also want to uh, thank Bueller for giving photo credit when posting uh, an actual picture, I think from, I don't know if it was one of our collaborated account, uh, collaborated posts that you took and then we posted on Dodger blue, but he did that. And we uh, ran into some issue uh, from Dodger fest of a fan page posting your picture without mentioning us or you as being responsible for it. So we always appreciate when, whether it's a player or just fans using uh, stuff that you take, you know, I know that you, you take good pictures, you work hard to kind of get into position, and uh, it's always nice when we get uh, proper credit for that. Yeah, shout out to Landon Knack, too. He's been sharing a ton of our stuff. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's kind of it on the Bueller front. I don't know, Blake, is there any, anything you want to, any from the first three topics we sort of discussed, any loose ends? 
Um, I don't think so. I think we covered it all pretty well. I mean, Lamette's a reliever with some <laughs> upside. Bueller's going to start uh, have a delayed start to the season, which we already knew. And what was the middle thing we covered? I'm drawing a blank. Frasso. Oh, Frasso, yeah. Uh, that's the most disappointing one out of all of it and the most unexpected. So just unfortunate there. Yeah, definitely. Uh, all right, so we're breezing through tonight's show, and that brings us to uh, probably what we're going to spend the next half hour, 45 minutes, however long you guys want us to stay here, uh, sort of discussing. Uh, the Dodgers, like I've mentioned multiple times, the Dodgers had their Love LA Community Tour this past week. It ended with Dodger Fest at Dodger Stadium on Saturday. Uh, again, we were the only outlet that was at uh, an event every single day during the community tour. And we have videos that are uploaded. We also have uh, more videos coming, definitely from Dodger Fest, from Mookie's bowling event. Uh, so be sure to check those out. But Blake, what was, uh, let's focus on kind of the community tour aspect right now. I think I, I probably know uh, what the answer to this might be, but maybe what was the highlight for you? I feel like you're going to want me to say the universal one. Um, but you I really have to. It, it was definitely the coolest one and like it was a cool experience being at Universal Studios with all the players just walking around and kind of following them and seeing them interact with everything and playing all the games. I really like seeing Tony Gonsolin and Hunter Fiducia hanging out with the animals. That was a bit emotional too because seeing all the animals in the cages and all the animals without a home was kind of tough to deal with and see but still overall it was cool seeing them promote adoptions and try and get people to go out and make some new friends and family members by adopting. And then also the Jack in the box one, I thought was just kind of funny seeing all the players out of their element. That's one they do pretty much every year now. And it's just always a funny one seeing them hand out tacos and sign autographs from a Jack in the box. So I think those were my three favorites that I was at. Yeah, those are uh, good choices. I, I, it's not so much that I wanted you to pick Universal. I honestly just assumed that that's what it would be. And like you mentioned, it was something different that the Dodgers have done. Uh, they've been doing the community tour for several years now. And I don't remember them ever going to a theme park. I could be wrong. But at least recently, that was definitely uh, a change and a, and a nice addition to their weekly plan uh, and visit throughout the different communities in the greater Southern California area. I think uh, for me... It was interesting to see Andrew Friedman at the uh, reading event that Knack kind of, he led it in terms of reading to students, but Andrew Friedman and his wife were also there and they helped distribute books. And we got to speak to Friedman and that video is uh, up on our YouTube channel. So you might have to scroll back a little bit just because we've uploaded so much content this past week, but you will find it there. Uh, and it, for me, it was interesting to see him sort of in a different light because obviously Andrew Friedman to us, you know, we cover the Dodgers. He's the president of baseball operations. He's very much a you know baseball figure and yes there are times where we're, we have kind of you know off the record chats or just stuff that's not related to baseball uh, but those moments are kind of few and far between he's not necessarily always uh, available during a regular season because of different responsibilities he has going on so to see his wife is a former teacher and so to see like that that event really resonated with the both of them I thought was interesting uh, for me and then of course you know I was in uh, Corona at Corona High School for Joe for the pep rally that Joe Kelly was at, and I'm sure everybody has seen by now Joe and his wife Ashley uh, being challenged to a dance battle by two of the students there, uh, and so that was entertaining. And that uh, I didn't realize it until they brought it up at the time. That was actually the Dodgers' first event uh, in the Inland Empire, so that was kind of cool. And it was, I think, even more special for uh, Corona High School in that Joe Kelly obviously uh, is an alumni. So yeah, those were. Uh, some entertaining things I didn't get to do. I know it wasn't part of the community tour or Dodger Fest, but I didn't get to do uh, blanking out the uh, polar plunge, although I'm not sure if, how much uh, I'm not a huge like ocean guy to begin with. So I don't know uh, how, how much I would have gotten into the water. I will say based on the video I saw there, it, I don't think there are very many people that did what you did. It seemed like people ran up to like kind of where it stopped. I was just kind of in the water a bit getting photos and it was unexpected because the crowd just kind of kept pushing back. So I was backing up and then it was dry there. And then the next I noticed the tide came up and it got my shoes all wet a few times. So I didn't plan on it. It just kind of happened. 
But when you're talking about the dance battle, Joe Kelly, it reminded me the week also started with the birthday bash on Tuesday, I think it was. Yeah. And that was another fun one. That one's always a very like hectic and chaotic event. There's a lot going on with all the kids. They do one giant birthday party for kids experiencing homelessness that normally don't get to celebrate. So Landon Neck and Nick Frasso were there and they were hanging out with animals a lot and kind of there was a sloth they got to meet and they were petting and holding an alligator and an owl and a baby deer and then a dog. So that was a lot of fun. They had a dance battle with some of the kids too. So there's just a lot of events going on this week and it was fun to see all the players kind of out of the baseball setting and giving back to the community a bit. Yeah, and I think and kind of related to that too is the Dodgers, uh, they got a lot of their prospects involved uh, this year. And that was something I asked Andrew Friedman about, specifically with Landon Knack being there just because that was the event that they were both at. Uh, and Friedman said that, yeah, you know, the community tour does offer the Dodgers a chance to get some of their minor league prospects involved in something like that because giving back, you know, the Dodgers Foundation hosts different events throughout the year and even the offseason and players are involved in those and they make appearances and stuff like that. And so Freeman said it is important to the organization, the players, you know, really grasp that angle of it as well. And not just, hey, you know, we're here to be professional baseball players. I think that also helps them get accumulated to L.A. more because a lot of these guys, they're playing in Tulsa and Oklahoma City and coming from different states and backgrounds, different countries even. So to kind of bring them in L.A. and send them around the community, it helps helps them learn the area and figure things out and see the area a lot. So I think that's also a good aspect of it. And that's something Landon Knack kind of touched on when we were interviewing him. His fiance is from Southern California, but he's not. So he's had some help there, but he's really appreciated going back into the community and seeing everything. Yeah. So basically what I heard is it helps with uh, them learning how bad traffic can be. Yeah, but they also get to experience in and out. That's true. Uh, we have a super chat from Hawaiian Kira. It says, thank you for keeping us updated on this week's events. Might be obvious, but would you have bowled or taken the plunge? Uh, so when we're working these events, like it's it's we're working. We're not necessarily there to uh, participate in some of the fun. That being said, if you know if there was an opportunity, if we were uh, if you know maybe Dodgers Public Relations invited us to potentially bowl. Yes, I think I certainly would have. I don't necessarily want to speak for Blake. I think he's a yes as well. Uh, and in terms of taking the plunge, that's one that I would have passed on. Uh, if you missed it early in the show, Blake did kind of go into the water. I was giving him a little bit more credit than he uh, said. It actually ended up being, I called it about 25%. And you said it was, what, 15? 15, yeah. Yeah, so Blake did uh, a semi-plunge, uh, all for the sake of getting content for, the, for you guys and our website. Uh, book is there if you had an opportunity to do a full plunge with the players is that something you would have been interested in if they offered it I think it would have been hard to say no to that just because like it's a pretty unique experience I wouldn't have wanted to do it necessarily I think I'd definitely be more into the bowling but like you can't pass up once in a lifetime opportunity kind of things when they come around so I think that's how I would have looked at it yeah, that's that's a that's a good answer. And if we would have had to have given you a a, a GoPro like Alex Vesia to just, although I was disappointed, at least maybe I stopped watching it too early. He didn't do like a full blown like dive under the water with the GoPro. I think he's sort of at least the camera stayed above water. Uh, so I was a little disappointed with that. I thought maybe we we're going to see him sort of take a uh, literal uh, polar plunge. Uh, yeah, so that's that for kind of the community stuff and charity stuff. And as I mentioned. Again, we have all these videos up on our YouTube channel. More are definitely coming, so make sure you're subscribed. You ring the notification bell so you'll you'll find out as soon as those are live. You definitely don't want to miss anything. We have interviews, behind the scenes stuff, uh, and again, we were the only outlet that covered every single day of the community tour. Uh, so go ahead, Blake. I think we were at every event, but one there's we couldn't cover. Maybe two max, but I think we got most of there. I think it was eleven events total. Yeah, I know that one we didn't do, which wasn't necessarily, uh, it was more like kind of Dodgers organizational, like employee stuff. They did something on Monday. So I was at the employee day of service where they had some of their PR uh, members of the Dodgers Foundation were at the LA Regional Food Bank kind of helping, excuse me, helping pack uh, food packages. 
And either at that same time or shortly after, there was another similar event. But it, the way it was presented to us was that that was primarily uh, Bank of America employees with some people from the Dodgers doing uh, something similar. I forgot the exact specifics. So we do. Here's this question since we're on the topic. Uh, Ali Sheva said, did you attend the Jack in the Box event? So, yes, I went from Corona High School to Pep Rally with Joe Kelly and his wife, Ashley. They then went to Jack in the Box in Ontario. I met them there. Uh, we have a, one or two videos up from that. And Blake, go ahead. You were at the Northridge one. Yeah, they said Northridge. I kind of thought it was more Porter Ranch area. But yeah, I was at that one. It was Emmett Sheehan, and Michael Grove and Gavin Stone there working the drive through signing autographs, taking photos and giving out free tacos. So that was a lot of fun to see. And then, of course, the Dodgers Foundation was giving out the hats that I'm wearing right here and they also had shirts for people so it's a lot of fun there uh speaking of do you, can you do you have it with you the towel from the polar punch well, today can you show people? i thought it was a really really cool design I do so it's pretty big i don't know if it'll fit on camera it's all right just it scroll it. yeah just scroll it maybe go no the other way well okay well we're just there going we go. whatever way it works and if you're uh, if you're listening to this on the yes. podcast, we do apologize, but definitely uh, check out the YouTube video for a cool view of the towel that came from today's polar plunge. Uh, Blake needed that to you know dry off his his ankles because he didn't want to uh, get sick or anything while he was out there. Yeah, I didn't use it to do that. I was planning on it, but then I was like, I don't really want to ruin this. So I just kind of drove home with the wet feet. I think that actually happened while I was getting the Dave Roberts video from like right in their huddle they were doing. So uh, if, if I didn't get my feet wet, we wouldn't have had that great moment. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Blake, Nomo FOMO is putting you on the spot. He wants to know if you're giving that towel away. I'll I'll give you a hint, Nomo. Uh, if you trade him a lights, if you offer him a lightsaber, then he might trade it for you. Yeah, I think we could work out a trade for a Star Wars item or something, but I plan on keeping it. I'll see if I can get another one maybe, but yeah, I know Chris Taylor's foundation sometimes sells off extra stuff they have on their Instagram page, so you can keep an eye out there as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so yeah, so I think that does it kind of for the community stuff. Uh, tomorrow, Monday morning, Blake will be out at a golf course covering uh, the Justin Turner's event. We don't necessarily think that there's going to be actual golf, unfortunately, because of uh, some rain that has come into the Southern California area. But uh, we have been in contact with the Turners and they still will be putting on an event for people who paid to be there because uh, you know they don't want to just cancel and leave everybody hanging high and dry. So let's uh, shift to Dodger Fest now. And I'm, I'm not calling it Fan Fest. Uh, Blake, obviously, I think the big storyline is it Shohei Otani uh not only that he signed with the Dodgers obviously but this was his first time uh being around fans and in that type of environment wearing uh his jersey although they put the jersey on him at his introductory press conference uh let's focus with let's let's focus on Otani for now and people if, if you're watching this and you have specific questions about Otani throw those into the chat we'll try to answer them as we're sort of uh discussing this but what was the question about Otani? Just and sorry, yeah, no, that was my. It was uh, just open ended, just kind of your impression on seeing Otani there the first time in front of fans. Yeah, it was. I've been kind of saying this a lot. It was crazy and chaotic and hectic, and there was so much going on. And this is the Dodgers' life now. I think most people have seen that Otani security presence there is like fifteen to twenty security guards deep, just escorting him around everywhere. And every fan, when they saw him, just kind of went crazy yelling for him and screaming and chanting his name. It's like I compared it to the Taylor Swift of baseball. Like, it's that kind of presence. It's just something we haven't really seen before ever. And I know we always say that about his talent on the field, but that's also the same thing with his following off the field. Like, he is a true superstar of baseball. And there's not many athletes like that. I don't know if you can name any right now that have that same kind of, like, following that he has and just like there's fan accounts dedicated to him with hundreds of thousands of followers just posting Shohei Otani content and you're not getting that for Aaron Judge or Mookie Betts or any other superstars in baseball so I think that was really reflected at Dodger Fest this year 
they had to do two separate media scrums for him, one with English media and then one with Japanese media, just because there were so many people. And if you tried to have them all around at the same time, like you would have had people 10 yards back trying to get photos and audio and the audio already wasn't great there because they do it outside with fans watching and everyone screaming and all the speakers going on. So it was a lot, but Otani, I think he handled it pretty well. He seemed like he maybe came out of his shell a bit more than he did with the angels. Like, when he was on the stage at Fan Fest, he told all the fans he likes In N Out burgers and like that's gonna sell you to LA. Like I just mentioned In N Out earlier because of that. So it was just a lot and it's exciting to see him there, but at the same time, it's gonna be tougher to get around the team and get tickets and it's gonna create a trickle down effect that's maybe won't be as fun, but I think it'll be worth it seeing Otani on the field. Yeah, I agree with you. I think Otani handled it. Well, uh, obviously, I think the the media obligations that he has are are twofold because, like you said, there was one uh, kind of there was the first scrum was uh, English speaking reporters before they switched to the Japanese, and then yeah, he had to go on stage, and I think that was maybe hosted by Joe Davis or was, was it David Vasse at that point? Do you know? I'm not sure. I don't remember. Okay, but he definitely went on stage, and I know that there was uh, some laughs, and I think you you could see Otani's uh, personality sort of coming out, and I think that was good for the fans and good for him, you know. And what I thought was interesting in one of his answers, um, I forgot what the specific question was, but Otani basically alluded to the fact that he feels like he has to prove himself to the the Dodgers organization and the fans uh, type thing, and so. It's interesting to kind of see, you know, as much as he has sort of already accomplished as much talent as he already has, you can, you, you've seen since he signed with the Dodgers that he feels like he still has so much more to prove. Uh, and so that's interesting. Uh, let's see. So we do have some good questions and comments. Laura's saying she got tickets for Otani bobblehead night. She can't wait. That's good to hear. I know those uh, when regular season tickets went on sale, uh, I think, was it Friday morning? Uh, the second, I believe. So. Yeah, so that uh, the giveaways typically are the uh, first uh, games to sort of go quickly. Uh, Joe Punk wants to know why. So this is sort of reverting back a little bit. So we will answer why was Bueller ready to pitch at the end of last season, but now he's getting delayed. Bueller wasn't ever fully ready to pitch last season. That's why they ended up shutting him down. He was trying to make uh, an aggressive comeback. Uh, probably a little bit earlier than the Dodgers, I think, originally planned, but they were allowing him to sort of see it through potentially. And then once it got to a point where it just didn't necessarily make sense, they shut it down. But definitely Bueller, like I, I think it's safe to say, he was never at the point where he was, you know, they could have said, okay, fine, come back tomorrow. And then he was ready. Yeah, I think it was more about like he was maybe ready to pitch for an inning or so here. It's like a reliever role, but it was never like come back and be a big part of our rotation, which is what they needed at the time. And now they're, they just decided to play it more cautiously and that's kind of playing into now. And even last year, if he did come back to pitch, he would have thrown maybe like 10, 15 innings. And now you're looking ahead to a full season where he's going to have to throw a hundred plus. So it's a big difference there in terms of building up and what you need to actually do to be ready for that. So I think that also played into it. Yeah. Uh, here's a question kind of related back to the Otani discussion. Hawaiian Kira wants to know how many more reporters are there now? So for, there were definitely a lot more, but it's tough to gauge, uh, based on, I almost said fan fest on Dodger fest, because not necessarily every reporter who was there for that will then be there for spring training and games. But all that being said, Blake, we're certainly expecting a significant increase. Yeah, I think Dylan Hernandez in his article about it said the Dodgers approved 180 reporters for FanFest. And if I had to guess, last year it was maybe 50. So it's a pretty significant increase. When they had Otani's press conference, there was probably hundreds of reporters there. So there's going to be a lot more. We'll see how that actually plays out during the season and how everything goes. I've had questions about if the Dodgers are going to have to limit clubhouse access because you can't fit that many reporters in there without making all the players totally uncomfortable. So I think it's going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the, in terms of the clubhouse angle, that'll be uh, sort of interesting to see how the Dodgers uh, manage that because it's required that they make, that they open the clubhouse basically. So they can't just say, you know, we're going to close club. We're going to keep the clubhouse closed and just bring players out to the interview room. Uh, 
maybe Otani comes to the interview room and that kind of satisfies a lot of the international media who, but I feel like they still then would want to talk to, you know, uh, Freddie Freeman about Otani and Mookie Betts about Otani. I know Chris Taylor today at his event, uh, you tweeted that he's, he, I think it was a, it was lighthearted in nature, and it was almost like a joke, but not a joke. Where he said he's answered more questions about Otani than himself this off season, and that doesn't apply to just Taylor. You know, I'm sure we the different interviews that we were uh, part of at Dodger Fest, it was the same thing, right? Yeah, I think pretty much every interview I was in at least had Otani come up in some way at some point. Like I even brought it up to uh, Grove and Sheehan, like because all the fans were just coming in with Otani stuff. And I asked them, like, how much have they noticed that? And uh, they've kind of viewed that. So it's definitely kind of Otani's team at this point. And the rest of the players are maybe just a bit along for the ride more so. But, yeah, it's it's very Otani-focused right now. Yeah. Let's pause uh, the Dodger Fest talk really quick, because we have another super chat from Zip Code Zero. So it's blank but then he had another comment right after it so i'm assuming this is what he meant uh what was meant to be included what do you think was the deal breaker for led to not acquire corbin burns so if you missed it uh the brewers traded corbin burns to the orioles for a a pretty significant prospect haul yeah two top 10 prospects in their system and then a pretty high draft pick from their compensation round which are the only ones you're eligible to trade so it was a pretty significant haul, and I think that's what prevented the Dodgers from doing it. I mean, you're probably looking at something like, I want to say Andy Pajes, but I think the shortstop prospect the Brewers got back is a little more like safe and major league ready. So then you're probably looking at someone the Dodgers don't really have in their system. You probably would have had to build that deal around like a healthy Nick Frasso, but he's not healthy, of course, as we talked about earlier. So the Brewers really got back more major league ready talent in the deal. DL Hall is also has major league experience already, and he's kind of a highly touted pitching prospect. So I just don't think the Dodgers had the assets to get it done. And sometimes it really just comes down to what the other team prefers. Everyone rates farm systems and ranks prospects differently. And sometimes they'll prefer one prospect to another, and that'll get the deal done. There's just so many different conversations and things that go into getting a trade done that you can't just look at it and say, well, they gave up their number three and their number five prospects. So why didn't the Dodgers give up their number three and number five? Yeah. And I think, you know, another layer to that too is who knows, you know, there were reports that the Dodgers obviously had interest in Burns. And so I'm assuming they checked in and uh, when they did check in, their talks may have expanded to, you know, who, who are you looking for? What type of package do you want? Uh, And another thing to note, like, depending on the timing of everything, too, like if the Orioles made this offer more recently, even if the Brewers turned around and said to the Dodgers, hey, we have this on the table, would you be interested in matching it? The Dodgers need for starting pitching at this point, at least at the point when the trade was completed, is not nearly what it was, you know, two months ago, obviously. Uh, So that, I think, is a factor as well. And so is, you know, Corbin Burns is due to become a free agent after this season. And I believe he's represented by Scott Boris. Yeah. So short of, you know, I, I don't even know if there's a number. I mean, I assume maybe there's a ridiculous number that uh, Burns would potentially sign a contract extension for. Uh, but other than that, you know, you're potentially trading significant prospects for a rental, which, again, depending on the timing of everything, when the Dodgers may have discussed specific players with the Brewers, it's tough to say. But at this point, it's not necessarily a need of theirs. Yeah, I'm sure they had some discussions before the Tyler Glasnow trade there and decided that Glasnow with his extension and giving up Ryan Pepio to get that done was better than the cost to go get Burns and try and sign him to an extension, which didn't seem likely. Glasnow's deal is fairly team friendly from the sense it's not 200 or 300 million. It's it's a pretty good deal and they have similar upsides and talent levels. So it's probably just something where the Dodgers said this is the better deal for us and that's the one we're going to make. Yeah, so let's uh, let's stick with Glass now and Dodger Fest. And again, if you have questions about Dodger Fest or Glass now specifically, we'll answer them right now. And then if not, you know, we'll get to more questions sort of at the end. Uh, this was so Dodger Fest was Glass now's really first. He had been he was at Universal Studios. I think was that his was that the only event he was part of? Yeah. Okay, so that was kind of his first sort of introduction to uh, the Dodgers, if you will. He did his press conference over zoom if you could call it a press conference after the trade and uh, there's a little bit of a, of a mishap with his jersey so go ahead and tell everybody about that yeah so this offseason bobby miller switched from number 70 to number 28 
And then the first time Tyler Glass now put on a jersey, <laughs> it was number 28. So that led to some questions. Glass now was announced as wearing number 31 on the Dodgers 40 man roster. But I was able to confirm with Tyler that he will wear number 31. And that's what he ended up wearing at FanFest. It was just a mistake by the Dodgers there. To, they gave him the wrong jersey number. But it was just kind of funny because in between the time where I found out and I posted the photo of him, like there's a lot of questions about what number he was wearing. And it was just kind of funny. Was that uh, was that the only bit of uh, Glass Now information you got from Universal Studios, or was there something else? Yeah. Um, so as you all know, probably Tyler Glass Now has some great hair, and it's been <laughs> popular on Twitter talking about it. So I found out his hair care routine. I made sure to ask him that, and we have the video up as one of the shorts on our YouTube page, and I think it's also on Instagram. So go check it out if you haven't seen it. It's just pretty funny. Yeah, Blake is doing the uh, investigative journalism for everybody. Uh, so let's kind of shift it back to Dodger Fest and Glass. Now, that was then his first time, you know, at Dodger Stadium with it's similar to Otani, obviously, with fans in attendance as a member of the Dodgers. Uh, what struck me most, and you had a chance to see him at Universal, but I didn't realize you see, you know, players' height and weight listed with and stuff like that. He's, he's tall. Like, he, you see six seven on paper and then you see it in person like you you don't realize how tall he really is yeah i i found myself looking up to him a bit and i don't do that for many people it was the only person who's like ever made me say that kind of thing when i've been next to them was chris martin i think he was 610 and the dodgers had him he you're looking up to him when you talk to him but last now when i started recording that interview i realized i was a little low and had to kind of shift it up just for him because yeah, he, he's definitely towers over everyone he's around. Yeah. Uh, another thing, and I've seen some of the comments, if I could try finding them. Uh, I don't want to leave you guys with too much dead air. Uh, yeah, here, Golf Grouch said, Glass now looked like he was genuinely having fun. I think that's a great observation. Uh, I saw a couple pictures of him walking onto the main stage. You know, he's throwing his hands up. He was excited. He was definitely in a good mood when he was talking to us in the bullpen. Uh, and even, you know, kind of between... Uh, different things that they players had to be a part of, whether it was Q and A sessions or you know meet and greets or signing autographs, stuff like that. Like he definitely just looked upbeat, and he's been open about you know being excited to uh, get to pitch for the Dodgers. It was a team he grew up watching when he was a kid and driving in from Santa Clarita. He did joke that I don't know if he said his parents or maybe his family, uh, as much as he was excited for the trade, that they were more excited because of it. Uh, so again, I see here Nomo FOMO is asking about Glass now. He was at Polar Plunge and Bowling. Yes, that is correct. Uh, he was at both events. Um, I didn't get a chance to actually, I did talk to him at uh, the bowling event very quickly. Uh, so we'll have you know kind of a compilation video up at some point. Yeah, and everyone uh, in the chat's asking my height. I think I'm around like 6'1, so I wouldn't say I'm like very tall, but in baseball that's probably like the average of most athletes so there's not really many i'm looking up to like if i was in an nba clubhouse or an nfl clubhouse it might be different where more of the guys are like six four and up so yeah it's just it really like caught me off guard a bit when i first walked up to him to ask him about his jersey number because he's very tall yeah uh anything else from dodger fest you think we should kind of touch on we didn't we didn't get a ton of questions of people wanting to know sort of the ins and outs maybe everybody saw everything they needed to see i think otani said like seeing all the dodger fans it was the complete opposite of red he's used to seeing and it kind of made him like actually feel like he's here and a dodger now so i thought that was a pretty interesting quote um mookie Betts, of course kind of talked a bit and he gave some quotes on Twitter that riled people up. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. That's a good uh, refresh my memory. He was on uh, Mookie did an interview with Sports NLA kind of on their set and basically said that other teams when they play the Dodgers, it's their World Series. And I know that that's kind of for whatever reason has become a big deal on Twitter. I don't really know why. I I think. It, it, I think the Dodgers are in an interesting position because they've had World Series expectations, what, the past five, six, seven, eight years, right? At 11, least. 12. Right. Fine. Fine. But, like, I mean, I don't know if it was like in 2013 and 2014. Like, it, they weren't quite the same. But, yes, I get your point. So, 
that has always been in place. And yes, I think adding Otani, adding Yamamoto, adding Glass now, like I think it does raise, I don't know if it raises the expectations. I think it increases the pressure on the Dodgers, if that makes sense. And so Mookie's saying that, you know, other teams are going to get up to play the Dodgers. Like I, they have been, I think maybe they will a little bit more now because yes, they are, there is Otani and the big uh, buzzword being thrown around by reporters to players in different interviews. And we'll have an article up on it is, you know, how do the Dodgers feel being a proverbial villain now in, of, in major league baseball? But re- I mean, did Mookie say anything wrong? No, I don't think so. Like, I think people are looking at it as like other teams get the opportunity to play the Dodgers, but Mookie meant it as more like they're going to get hyped up because they want to beat the best in baseball. And that's what most people are calling the Dodgers. I mean, they went out and spent all this money. They already had a good team. They signed the best player in baseball. They added two of the best pitchers in baseball. And the expectations are high, and they're the betting World Series favorite for a reason. And I think other teams know that, and they do want to go out and prove that they're going to be able to keep up with the Dodgers. So I don't think it was like we're so much better than every other team. Like you have to look up to us and praise us. It was more just like that is kind of how other teams end up playing the Dodgers, and it's kind of always been that way for a bit. And that happens in every sport. Like you see everyone wants to beat the Chiefs in football or the Patriots during their dynasty. Everyone always wanted to beat them or like it's just – that happens in sports. It's kind of what makes them great. Like everyone wanted to beat the Jordan Bulls and Kobe's Lakers. Like it's just, that's what happens. And that's what kind of Mookie was referring to. Look at Blake tapping into his basketball knowledge there. Yeah. Uh, we Pretty have a rare. question. <laughs> we have a question from DJ Jesse. Didn't see Teoscar. Was he there? Teoscar Hernandez was not uh, at Dodger Fest. Neither was Austin Barnes. There are a few players who were absent uh, for different reasons. You know, spring tr- pitchers and catchers are reporting This week, first full squad workout is on Valentine's Day. So baseball is kind of right around the corner. So these guys may have been uh, tying up some things, you know, maybe at home before they head out to Camelback Ranch. Uh, But yeah, back to the movie thing. I, yeah, I don't, I mean, it's the, it's the, I don't want to say culture we live in, but the environment we live in, just the way things are, like stuff gets blown out of proportion. And, and, and yeah, I think anybody saying that Mookie was, alluding to or suggesting or implying or flat out saying that, you know, other teams need to look up to the dot, like is just disingenuous at best, if, if not just a flat out lie, because all he was saying was yes, like teams are going to get excited to play the Dodgers. Not, Dave Roberts has said that uh, several times over the past few years that, you know, the Dodgers have to be ready for every team's best punch that he said, we get it every, every series there's, you know, these teams want to beat the Dodgers. So Nothing has really changed. If anything, maybe teams want to have a little extra motivation to try to beat uh, the Dodgers when they play them. But other than that, yeah, Mookie's uh, comments were much ado about nothing. And as for, you know, the whole villain thing, we'll, I think we'll spend, we'll do a, a video kind of specific on that once we have, you know, full quotes from everybody. I do know that Max Muncy, I mean, Mookie, he told David Vasse on Dodger Talk a couple of weeks ago, you know, what are, what do people expect the Dodgers to do? Like not try, like that doesn't make sense. And that was a sentiment that Max Muncy echoed and and they gave credit, you know, they basically said that Mookie answered that question. Uh, I forgot who else brought it. I think Gavin Lux might've referenced Mookie's uh, quote in turn about that as well. Freddie Freeman, same thing. Uh, Muncy even noted that Dodgers, you know, all this talk about their spending, like they don't even have the highest payroll in baseball. Yeah, that's it's for me, the spending stuff really just came down to it all happened in one off season instead of like multiple, if they spread this out over five years, like no one would have cared, even if it was the same contracts, but it just kind of worked out where it all came in the off season. Cause that's when the players they targeted became available and it worked out that they could actually get them. So that's what it is. I think another player noted that they haven't even spent a billion. They're spending like 50 million or 60 million or whatever it is on the players. They signed this off season bit of thanks to Tani. They are deferring most of his money. And I think Bueller had a pretty funny quote about the, uh, villain role he said like everyone said the Dodgers couldn't get it done and then they got it done and then everyone said like they're not going to get anyone and then they went out and got it everyone and now they're the villains because of it like it's just all kind of overblown it's just the narrative of the time yeah and I don't know like it like I've I've brought it up and you just brought, mentioned it again like everybody's so mad about the money the Dodgers have spent they're only paying Otani two million to play for them so What's there to be upset about? Present day value of what, 464 million or something yeah. like that. It's not yeah. that bad. It's a bargain. 
Uh, here's a question from Young. It says, how about the polar plunge with CT in Manhattan Beach? So, yes, if you missed uh, the beginning of our show, Blake was out at Manhattan Beach this morning getting us footage, doing a 15% uh, polar plunge. He said he was up to about his ankles to get some pictures and video, uh, recap video with interviews uh, with Chris Taylor and uh, Michael Grove, James Outman, and Bobby Miller. Bobby Miller, anybody? I think. Landon Knack was there, yeah. too. I got JP Fire Eisen. That's right. I feel like I might be forgetting someone, but yeah, so we got a few interviews there. Chris Taylor, of course. Basically, there's a summary video of the event plus interviews up on our YouTube channel. So definitely watch that after uh, we're done here answering some questions. Uh, Blake, I don't, I don't want to make you repeat yourself too much, but uh, I don't think Yong was with us at the beginning of the show. Can you just give him a quick rundown of what it was? Yeah, so Chris Taylor is holding his first annual charity event where they go to the beach and they take a polar plunge. They jump into the cold water. The water was about 58 degrees, which what the lifeguards told us. So they were expecting it to be a little colder. It wasn't as bad. The air outside was colder than that. But they all jumped in. They were sponsored by people. I think Fire Eisen had the second most sponsor donations, which was a bit surprising to me. But good for Fire Eisen. We've been hyping them up on the show a bit, so... Take some credit there for our guy. And yeah, it's just a really fun event. All the players got hyped up for it and came out and jumped into the cold water and then ran out. And yeah, go watch the video. It's pretty funny. Yeah, there we go. That sums it up. Uh, Ricardo Ayala says it's nice that most of the players showed up at Dodger Fest. I agree. You know, they had a definitely a strong showing when we got the printed out list of the players that would be speaking to us. And obviously that meant that they were going to be there in attendance. It was certainly a lot more than I anticipated. And I think that that probably is why Mookie and Chris Taylor then timed their respective uh, foundation events for this weekend, as much as Mookie's bowling night on Saturday after Dodger Fest created a little bit of logistical uh, headache for us. We're definitely happy, more than happy to be able to cover both events and players were at Mookie's bowling uh, at Lucky Strike in downtown LA. And then basically the entire team, pretty much everybody who was at Dodger Fest then showed up to uh, Chris Taylor's Polar Plunge uh, on Sunday. So that was nice. Uh, Alia says, did you guys see Hyun Suk Jang? He's pretty tall too. So yeah, this is kind of funny. We did see, we saw him walking through the bullpen and kind of, he then stopped and posed with, I think it was Sheehan and Grove, uh, some of the younger pitchers to take a picture. And so then Blake and I looked at each other like, wait, like, who is that? We he wasn't in a jersey. It was just, I think, in a, like a black jacket, black t-shirt kept walking and then came back through the bullpen and you know there was more like you could tell that he was somebody and then we kind of figured out after the fact who he was yeah he started posting on his instagram a bit and showing off kind of behind the scenes more so that's when i found out i figured he was like someone who was paying for it so apologies to him but i haven't seen him before like to recognize him like that and i don't think any of the other reporters really recognized him either but good to finally see him in person yeah, uh, let's see. So we can start taking uh, questions if you guys have those. Just put. Uh, remember to start it with question in all caps. It could be about Dodger Fest. It could be about the Dodgers, spring training, uh, the events that we covered this week, uh, off-topic stuff. It doesn't matter. We'll get to it. And again, if you want to make sure we answer your question, then Super Chat is the way to go. And other than that, we'll answer as many as we can. Let me see. I did see one. So Doom Sal is asking Yamamoto. Yamamoto was not uh, part of any events. Yeah, I believe uh, he's been in Japan. So might be taking care of some final things before heading out to spring yeah. training. Yeah, a little bit of a different uh, commute for him before he needs to head out to Arizona. Here's a good question from Dave Luna. Is there a player you guys get sort of starstruck or excited to see play on the Dodgers now or in the past? Starstruck, I'd say, like, when I first started being in the clubhouse, it was probably Kershaw, just, like, I grew up watching him and then being, like, right next to him, standing there in the clubhouse. It was pretty surreal. Um, now I, I would say that's probably a bit more Otani just because, like, he's a Dodger, and it's kind of crazy that we got to that point, actually, because he's probably one of the best players ever. Um excited it's probably also going to be otani and yamamoto all throw in there as well but i'd say i'm getting a bit more relaxed and like being in the around them and not like as much starstruck anymore so that's kind of my answer for it 
Yeah, I agree on the uh, the Kershaw one for the same reason. He's somebody, you know, he's Clayton Kershaw. And back when I was when I first started and was in the clubhouse for my first time, he was certainly still uh, at his peak, if maybe not necessarily quite there yet. Um, so yeah, that was uh, kind of a, a the starstruck moment for me as well. Uh, let's see, we got some questions that came in here. Uh, well, we could stick with Dave. How likely do you both feel Kike Hernandez comes back? David Vasse said there's a chance, but they would need to trade Marco. Why would he be promoting hope for a Kike reunion? Uh, I can't necessarily answer the, the final part of that. I'm not sure. Like, I don't think David Vasse is necessarily trying to promote any hope with Kike. Um, I don't think it's likely that he's back. Like I had Daniel filled in for you uh, last week, and we were discussing... Uh, some of the Kenley Jansen rumors and Ken Rosenthal did report, if you missed it, that there's uh, the Angels have interest in Kike, but they believe that his preference is to re-sign with the Dodgers. And so I floated the theory to Daniel of, look, if the Dodgers are looking for a, kind of a back-end high-leverage relief pitcher, is there a scenario where they trade with the Red Sox, send Margot to Boston, get Kenley, and then re-sign Kike at that point that's kind of the it's a lot and that's really the only way I see something like that happening where do you stand on Kike coming back or not coming back I think they might be open to it maybe when they open up a spot on the 40-man roster when they put some of the guys on the 60-day IL I just wouldn't bet on it I mean I guess with all the news that's come out I'm more optimistic he might come back than I was previously before I would have said maybe like zero to one percent and maybe now i'm at 10 to 15 percent so i really don't think it's gonna happen but i guess it wouldn't totally shock me if it does happen is there even like room for him on the roster though you can always make room somehow you start a guy in triple a that wouldn't necessarily have been there before you make a trade you wait for someone to get injured it's just those roster moves always work themselves out like it seems like every year we talk about like Who's going to be left off the roster? They have so many good players. And then it's like, it comes down to the, setting the roster. And it's like, who's going to be the last spot? We need to find someone because all these guys got hurt and this happened. And it's just, it, they always work themselves out. So I don't think it's really a problem to have too many good players. And if Kike wants to be back and he's going to take a deal that works with the Dodgers that they're comfortable with, like, I think it would be beneficial to get him back. I just, I still think some other team is going to pay him a bit more and he'll probably end up going there. Yeah, I agree. Uh, here's another question from Aleluya One. Where was the picture taken between Walker and Shohei? So that was inside the Gold Glove Bar. It was closed off to fans uh, during Dodger Fest because that's where the Dodgers PR were taking players. It's kind of like a green room. Uh, they take them in there, give them their jersey, kind of go over the the plan of when they were going to talk to the media in the bullpen, and then whatever sort of uh, activations or activities that they were then part of. Uh, here's a good question from J2. Which bobblehead day will be the most popular? Matt Kemp was trending for a bit. So I'll, I, I'm looking forward to the Matt Kemp bobblehead. I think that one has potential to be really cool. I'm hoping that they go with uh, his celebration and reaction after he hit the second. I think it was ended up being a double. His walk-off double against Archie Bradley. Remember there was that one series a few years back where he had back-to-back -back games with walk-off hits? I'm hoping it's him basically yelling as he was rounding second base. Uh, so looking at the bobblehead schedule specifically, and it should be noted, and we have that up on dodgerblue.com if you want to find that, and it should be noted that there are four dates that are bobblehead giveaways that haven't been revealed yet. So my answer could change, but as of now, I think the uh, Kemp one is what I'm most looking forward to, but most popular is going to be the two Otani bobbleheads. Yeah, I don't think that's really a question. And I think right behind that will be the Yamamoto bobblehead. And then I think the Tyler Glass now one's a good sleeper pick to be there. Maybe they could get creative and play that up and put like actual hair on it there. Like I know the Tulsa Drillers did one like that with Dustin May before. So it's been done. And I think that would be kind of funny. And I don't mean actual hair, of course. I mean like string kind of stuff. But yeah, I think that would be really cool. Thank you for clarifying that because in my head, all I was visualizing was you needed them to go cut Glassnow's hair and then attach it to each individual bobblehead that they were going to be giving out. Yeah, I realized my wording at the start <laughs> might have been misconstrued a bit there. So I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, thank you for that, Blake. Thank you. Uh, 
David wants to know Freeman or Ota- Freeman Otani or Otani Freeman. I prefer Freeman two, Otani three. So yeah, the lineup is is going to be something uh, that's that's it has been discussed at, at nauseum since Otani was signed. Dave Roberts, I think at Dodger Fest did sort of suggest strongly imply that I think it would be Mookie Freeman Otani. Uh, what how would you want to see that shaking out? How I'd want to see it is that probably going to be the popular one. I'd say Otani bets Freeman. I I like Otani and the idea of a leadoff hitter role there and then bets behind him and Freeman. I think it's going to end up being Freeman in the two hole. But with the more likely options, I'd probably prefer to see Otani in the two hole. I think it would be more beneficial to have the speed of Betts and Otani ahead of Freeman. And not that Freeman's a bad or slow base runner or anything. He's just not Otani and bet speed. So that's kind of how I'd shape it up. But at the end of the day, I really don't think it matters. You can put them in any order and it, it's not going to change a thing. I agree with you. I think I would be on board with Otani as leadoff hitter as well. Uh, if he's not hitting first, I think I would put him third. But I mean, however it's ordered, like there's I'm not going to lose sleep over it or get upset. Like I, it's fine. Uh Speaking of Otani and Otani bobblehead, City Boy Chad is another one who got uh, tickets to that. And I do also want to mention that if you want to buy an Otani bobblehead, it's not going to be the one the Dodgers are giving away. But Foco does have, I think, a couple versions still available. They've released, I think, five or six different Otani bobbleheads in here. I can throw the link in the chat for everybody. Uh, The majority of them have sold out, but I did happen to see either yesterday or the day before that there were still some. So... Oops, that's the wrong link. So bear with me there. <laughs> um, I'll throw out. Uh, there's some questions about the Star Wars bobblehead promotion. Yeah. While you do that, so I'll answer that. Um, I think it's more creative than the ones. If for people who aren't aware, it's Dodger Stadium as the base, and then it has the Millennium Falcon that kind of flies over it and bobbles. So I like it more than the beanie giveaways they've done. I still think they're missing out on a CT 3PO bobblehead, like. That's just right there. It's perfect. They have to do it. And I'll keep pushing for that until they actually do it. But I do like the giveaway they're doing this year. Yeah. Ira2000 says, no Hello Kitty bobblehead this year. I did not see that. I think, are they doing a Hello Kitty night is what's on the schedule right now? Pretty sure I saw that. They usually do one every year. So it would really shock me if they don't. So, yeah. Uh, Let's see. Any more questions? Uh, GI wants to know Devin Williams, yay or nay? Depending on the cost, like that would be a fantastic addition to the Dodgers. I, I mean, he's one of the better relievers in baseball. So if you pair him with Evan Phillips at the back of your bullpen, like that's probably the best one two combo in baseball right there. So I think it would be great. The cost is going to be really high. And I'm not sure the Dodgers would prefer to do that instead of signing Ryan Brazier or someone on the free agent market. So I don't really see it happening, but I would love to see it happen. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think there's Brazier's more likely. I think a trade for Kenley is more likely than Devin Williams. That being said, I don't think a trade for Jansen is uh, all that probable. Judy wants to know, when do you think the rest of Scott Moritz's clients will sign? Um, Maybe they're going to take one-year deals with the Dodgers at this point, but being serious here i'd say within the next two weeks we'll probably see most of them signed and probably the majority of them before spring training starts for most teams the dodgers are reporting earlier than other teams due to the korea series so there's some time there for other teams to still get deals done but there's a lot of talent left over still and that's probably a bit surprising but with boris i guess we could have expected that Related to that, Nomofomo wants to know if Cody Bellinger is still a free agent. He is. And uh, basically everybody keeps saying that the Cubs are the most likely fit. They make the most sense. And so at this point, I think it's just a matter of figuring out uh, contract terms if, for Bellinger to be back in Chicago. Uh, the right field pavilion, which, by the way, was undergoing like some construction. You're getting some new seats. So no problem that you're delayed in joining us tonight. We haven't seen Bob Nightingale tonight, and he wasn't at uh, Dodger Fest. So, Bob, if you're watching, please, you know, get let us know that you're still here. Uh, he says, right field pavilion says, my apologies if this question was asked earlier, but was Yamamoto at Dodger Fest? He was not. Uh, as Blake mentioned, he's been in Japan. 
we assume probably probably finishing up some last minute things before coming stateside to then go to Camelback Ranch because like we've mentioned throughout the show tonight pitchers and catchers have to report by the ninth and that's uh coming up uh let's see what else we have here again if you guys if you have a question just please start with question in all caps it makes it easier for us to find it in the comments uh here's another one from judy who do you think will pitch opening day at dodger stadium i feel like it's gonna be yamamoto <clears throat> it was reported he kind of wants the spotlight so i think the dodgers might have kind of said to him like sign with us and we'll get you the spotlight we'll put you on opening day to start at Dodger Stadium and the Korea series. And that's going to be a pretty big spotlight there. Wouldn't totally surprise me if Glass now pitches the home opener at Dodger Stadium and Yamamoto does the one in Korea. Might depend on how they're each building up and how it actually plays out with days off and all that. But it'll probably be one of those two. And I think that's pretty safe to say. Yeah, here's uh, I think it ties in well to our discussion. Mike C says Dodger Fest was great, bit cold, but good day. Got to walk. I'm assuming he said he meant on the field. Uh, I meant to bring this up earlier. You know, kind of like what, what did you think? Because the setup was a little bit different this year. Maybe it might have been a similar last year where basically all that the outfield had was sort of the main stage. And that had a different look. It was smaller. It had a couch setting instead of, you know, chairs lined up, which I thought was nice. But then everything else was outside of the stadium. Yeah, I, I was not a fan of the setup that they did this year. Last year, they had the stage in right field, and then they had a bunch of other stuff like on the field, in left field, and a bit in center field, I think. And that made it easier for fans to kind of experience everything. As a person in the media, it made our jobs a lot easier to be able to just kind of go between them quickly. And this time, they sent us around. So we weren't able to get as much content like from the field and get all those interviews and everything that was happening on the field we kind of had to stick to the bullpen or else we were going to miss maybe like five to ten minutes worth of stuff just because of how long it took for everyone to get around and so i thought it wasn't set up the best and i haven't heard from many fans of how they preferred it last year and previous years versus this year but it was very packed and i think the dodgers kind of thought they would have to change it to make it more suitable for the number of fans they were going to have and that's probably what they decided was going to be the best way to do it. But I wasn't a huge fan of it. Yeah. So Judy says it felt really squished. Ira 2000s is too much walking. Hawaiian Kira says everything was spread out. Yeah. So uh, Dodgers certainly had their reasons for changing the structure and kind of the layout. It'll be interesting to see uh, what they do sort of moving forward. So let's take a couple of super chats and then that might be it unless we get some final questions. Uh, Rod, I see a super chat. Thank you for that. I don't, there's not, unfortunately not a comment or a question for us. So if you have it reply again with what your question may be, and we'll answer that. You don't have to do another super chat. Just definitely throw it in there and we'll pull it up. Uh, Laura, thank you for watching. I know you're with us pretty much every week. She wants to know, do you have any concerns with numerous pitchers coming back from injury? For me, I think I always have concerns about pitchers, regardless of if they're hurt at the time or not. I've said it numerous times, pitchers break. It's just how it goes. So there's always that concern there. And then it's added concern when they are coming back from an injury. We don't know what they're going to do. We don't know how they're going to rehab and come back and perform. Sometimes it takes time to shake off rust. And there's there's pains to go through and all that. And getting back and performing back to the level they were used to. I've made my thoughts known about my concerns with Walker Bueller coming back and the struggles he kind of had before his injury. I think there's some concern with Fire Eyes and he hasn't pitched in quite a while. There's some concern with Trine and he hasn't pitched in a while. Like there's just always that concern, but that's kind of just the risk of being a pitcher. Yeah, I think my biggest concern is with uh Bueller and Glass now. And that's because I think in the bullpen, the Dodgers have enough depth that if I don't know how much they're necessarily counting on Trine to be back to Blake Trine. And so I think between Trine and Fire eyes, and you'll get one of the two that can, you know, stay healthy and pitch well for, you know, the majority of the season. With Bueller and Glass now, there's a little bit more, I think, dependence on. And yes, the Dodgers have young starting pitchers, but we've seen the last two years, by the time they've gotten to October, they've run out of pitching depth basically because of injuries. And so my bigger concern is with the starters. Um, that being said, you know, yeah, Blake, Blake, you know, 
the, a starter could be fully healthy. And unfortunately, if they get hurt, they get hurt. It's kind of uh, just the, uh, the way it goes with pitchers. Sorry, I, had, I felt like I had a better way of saying that. And then I lost my train of thought. So I don't want to leave you guys hanging. Nomo FOMO, speaking of injuries, says, uh, question, did something happen to Paxton? Yeah, so it's not entirely clear what's going on with James Paxton, but Ken Rosenthal did uh, come out with a report that the Dodgers, there was a health issue with Paxton, and so his contract, I think the the salary is what was decreased, and now he has more bonuses or something. Do you know the specifics? Yeah, I think, I think it went from $11 million base salary to 7 million base salary with increased incentives that could still bring it up to 13 million. So it's probably just something kind of minor they saw and like want to protect themselves. It's kind of, it happens probably more often than we think. And sometimes it comes out and sometimes it doesn't. I mean, the most notable ones have made deals fall apart, like the Correa situation with him failing physicals. So just something that kind of happens and why the teams do their physicals before making contracts official. But I don't think it's anything to worry about too much until it actually becomes a problem that affects them and we hear about it. It seems at this point like they still feel he's going to pitch and be healthy and ready to go. Here's a, a good question from the right field pavilion, which you sort of touched on earlier. He wants to know, did anybody see Otani's uh, scar near his right elbow at Dodger Fest? Blake, I'm not sure. Did you happen to see that by any chance? Yeah, I got a picture of him waving to some fans and it kind of put his scar right there. And then that tweet blew up a bit and a lot of people like like the picture. But then there's also people who are just talking about a scar and noticing it. When I took the picture and posted it, I didn't notice the scar. I was kind of doing everything quickly and just saw it was a good photo. So I liked it and posted it. But yeah, when I saw everyone talking about the scar in my notifications, I looked and it, it it's not pretty. I think you can't expect that for like any scars really. He had elbow surgery, and that's kind of how it goes. But, yeah, I mean, I think if you see any pitcher after an elbow surgery, it's going to look pretty similar. It's just we normally don't see it as often, and at least not that clear. Yeah. All right. So we are winding down. I did see something that I thought was pretty interesting, and it's perfect for Blake. Uh, Tom Galindo says, I'm an architect student working on a project for fun. What kind of shops, restaurants, et cetera, would you like to see in the Dodger Stadium parking lot? Think downtown Disney, but in the parking lot of the stadium. This is tough because I feel like the parking there is already so bad that you can't put places that are going to make it even worse. So, like, I feel like that's going to rule out raising canes and in and out, even <laughs> though I think those would be great. But think of the parking situation there with those two restaurants. It wouldn't be ideal. Maybe a Five Guys would be cool there some kind of good mexican restaurant um you gotta have a japanese restaurant there now of course um the shops are gonna be dodger themed and baseball themed i assume a dodger clubhouse store there instead of making fans go into like top deck on the off days you could do a store right there and let fans go in so i'm not sure i haven't thought about this before kind of putting me on the spot here but i don't know matt do you have anything <laughs> I think I like your in and out raising canes idea. Maybe they make it uh, so that it's like walk up only and it's it's basically open like four games. So you're not going to like drive through and then go park. You have to park your car and then go. But I mean, that being said, we've taught the logistics of, you know, a chain like in and out going to Dodger Stadium isn't likely. I've said repeatedly my uh, preference is stadiums that are kind of built in cities just because especially for us like we get there so early that it's easy to go into the state like somewhere like petco park you go into the stadium set our stuff down in the press box if i want to go grab food really quick i could take a 10 15 minute walk get something go back to the stadium be be there with plenty of time to still you know do everything we need to do before a game during a game and all that Whereas with Dodger Stadium, once you drive in, even though we're still getting there at the same time as we would at, you know, in San Diego, you're kind of stuck and you're, you can't really, you can't order food in. Uh, so that's always been one downside, uh, in my opinion, to Dodger Stadium. Uh, yeah, so let's see. I mean, people are saying you could rent the In-N-Out truck. BMR 209 says taco trucks. Oh, I know those, the hot dog vendors, like outside of SoFi with the bacon wrapped hot dogs, Dodger Stadium has to get those. We can even like just make a shop for them there. And that's the restaurant we need there. Yeah, that's but a then, good call. I don't, I don't know if Dodger dogs would ever sell. So that wouldn't happen. Yeah. 
All right. So since we're discussing food, let's let's end on something like that. I want to give Blake a little bit of a hard time because he was out at the stadium for uh, Mookie and Brianna Betts did a financial literacy event for some was it high school students? Yeah. And then Blake had a little bit of a window before he was going to uh, go to the animal shelter for the second event of the Dodgers community tour. So he texted me saying, hey, like, you know, what would you recommend to eat? Like, I have some time. I sent him four different places. Uh, he chose none of them. So I just want to give him a little bit of a hard time there. But my my real question for you is, uh, where do you stand on Krispy Kreme? They're okay. I mean, I don't love them. I think you can find better donuts at a local donut shop usually, but I mean, they're fine. I don't like hate them. I, I think they're overrated probably, but I don't like think they're bad. All right. Yeah, fair enough. I think overrated is probably the best way to say it. I'm not a huge fan. I mean, I don't particularly care for it, but I was just curious. But can we uh, talk about the places you recommended, like an expensive taco place, a place where you said the lasagna was the only good thing? Uh, yeah. Well, here, let's chip sandwich place. Like, let's let's name. We can name them so that people uh, can get the full context. So when Blake asked me for places, I recommended Guisados, which is right down the hill. Obviously, as a lot of people know from the stadium, I did warn him that it is a little, little expensive for tacos, but it's very good. Uh, Philippe's, which is obviously uh, a L.A. staple. Uh, Cielito Lindo, which is Taquitos down at Alvera Street. But uh, it was, was it raining or at least drizzling? Uh, yeah, it was raining and I had my computer and needed to get the Mookie video done. So I needed an indoor place with guaranteed dry seats. Yeah, so I did warn him that I wasn't sure about, I know that they have a little kind of patio uh, area that's covered, but I didn't know if maybe rain would still get in there. And what was the last? Oh, Eastside Deli, uh, which I know a lot of people like. I think their lasagna is good. Their sandwiches and stuff, I think, are a little overrated. And I couldn't remember. I forget what day is lasagna day. And so that was kind of the warning that I gave Blake. Still four very good choices. And then he texts me saying what? I went to the Oinkster, which is also a fantastic choice. Got a good pastrami sandwich with some fries and did my work in a dry room. And I also looked up all the reviews on the places you gave me and like everyone said they're packed and crazy during lunch hours. So I didn't really want to deal with that. I needed somewhere a bit more quiet to go work and kind of get it done quickly, get my food out quickly and not have to wait in long lines. So I think I made the right choice, but I'll have to try some of those places at some point. Yeah, so it shouldn't come as any surprise because my food takes are always wildly popular on our show, but Nomo Fomo agrees with me about Guisados. Laura, the same thing. She says it's great. She is also a fan of Cielito Lindo. Uh, let's see. Hawaiian Kira says the only place I know are Philippe's and a Chinese place that she can't think of the name of, but they serve slippery shrimp. Uh, BMR209 says every day is lasagna day at Eastside Deli. I don't remember that being the case, but if it is, then Blake, you probably could have ended up going there, been okay. Although that one, I think out of the options I gave you definitely is the busiest kind of like at all times, especially around lunchtime. Yeah. I, I just wasn't really in the mood for lasagna at the time. So like I will try it someday, but that wasn't the day. Oh, there here's Bob go. showing up. Yeah, right as we we're about to close the show down, Bob Nightingale says, low boy for burgers and homage brewing he's a fan of. Uh, low boy, I think, is that Pasadena or Burbank? I feel like we've heard the name from people before. I'm not sure. But I will give you credit. The uh, Lazy Dog is very good. And you pretty much recommended that one. And we went there. Yeah, that was uh, between Dodger Fest and Mookie's bowling event. We killed a little bit of time at LA Live. Uh, had Lazy Dog. I didn't know that Blake had never been there before, so I'm glad he liked it because I feel bad if I recommend something and that I think is good and then people end up not liking it. No, people are saying Low Boys in Silver Lake. Bob Nightingale said it's on Sunset, so we'll have to look that up then. Real quick, anyone in the chat know about sweet potato tater tots? Because they had that at Lazy Dogs, and we neither of us had ever heard of it before, but they were pretty incredible there. So I don't know. It was interesting there. And the uh, the bacon cheddar biscuits yeah. we got, those were pretty good too. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, yeah, I thought sweet so they said sweet potato, and I was thinking fries, and it said tater tots. And so that as soon as I knew I think you're you're naturally you like tater tots, right? 
Yeah. I, I mean, I like all forms of potatoes pretty much, but I don't think tater tots are my favorite necessarily, but they're good. Uh, our friend Bob says that Sonic used to have them. There's so. no Sonic near me, so. Yeah. I don't think there's one near me either. Uh, yeah, I think that does it. Now uh, I'm going to have to go have dinner, watch uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Final season is starting tonight. Blake, are you a fan? I forget if you watch it or not. Yeah, I've seen them all and a bit disappointed that the final season's starting, but looking forward to it also. Yeah, me too. Hopefully it doesn't uh, let us down because I feel like some of the recent seasons were sort of mixed uh, episodes. Yeah, that's going to do it for us tonight. Again, thank you guys for sort of uh, indulging us with some of the food talk at the end. If you're new, we kind of like to close the show on a little bit of a light note. And uh, I have good food takes. Blake sometimes has good food takes. Jeff's not that great. So it typically leads to a spirited sort of debate and conversation with you all. Uh, but yeah, again, that's going to do it for tonight. Reminder, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like this video, definitely keep an, ring the notification bell, keep an eye out for uh, more content we have coming. We still have some Dodger Fest videos to get up. Like I said, some interviews from Mookie's Bowling and a little bit uh, behind the scenes stuff from that as well. Uh, that's going to do it for Blake and I'm Matthew. We'll see you next time.